Welcome to Dig, a history podcast. One pleasant May day in 1704, Agnes Katerina Schicken was walking through a village in Tübingen, Germany, where she stopped and asked a villager for a glass of milk. After finishing her milk, she thanked the Good Samaritan and continued her stroll. She approached a group of young boys and asked one of them to accompany her up the road to give her directions back home. A seven-year-old boy named Hans Michael Furch agreed to show her the way after she promised him a gift. The other boys, at first, insisted on coming too, but she convinced them to stay behind. Agnes and the boy walked along a path in the nearby forest, which was bustling with hunters, travelers, and woodsmen. As they walked, they chatted, rested, and played games. One witness saw her affectionately delousing his hair, an intimate act often performed between mother and son. Eventually, the boy asked to go home. It was then that Shicken angrily threw him to the ground and, ignoring his pleas for forgiveness, sliced open his throat with a knife she'd been carrying in her pocket. His throat was sliced so deeply that she later testified that she could, quote, look down into his neck, end quote. Leaving him bleeding to death in the forest, Agnes walked to the next town and presented herself to the next people she saw. She went compliantly with the town's imperial voked kind of like a constable in early modern Germany, who took her to jail. She told onlookers confidently that, quote, now the hangman would surely dispatch her. Agnes cooperated, making judicial torture unnecessary. During the Volk's investigation, he discovered that six years ago, she had slept with a soldier in the forest. Because she declined to be in a relationship with him after, he cursed her. Agnes told the Volk that she no longer felt right. She suspected the devil had possessed her. Her neighbors testified to her sudden sexual promiscuity and other strange behaviors since the curse. Agnes had attempted suicide several times and spent time being treated by a barber surgeon after one of those attempts. During her period of distress, she also worked as a beggar in the countryside. After discovering that Agnes's father had taken his own life in the forest long ago, the jurists in charge of Agnes's trial concluded that she suffered from melancholy, which she had inherited from her father. Instead of execution, Agnes was sentenced to whipping and confinement in a poorhouse, where she would receive medical care and religious counsel. For most people, I suspect, their familiarity with torture, corporal punishment, and execution um, for capital crime is confined to some gnarly anecdotes, perhaps a few graphic movie scenes, a little Monty Python, and if you're cool like me, your high school history project about medieval torture devices, like the pear, the exploding pear, yeah? Um, But everything has a history, and those things barely scratch the surface. Legal historians have been uncovering, measuring, and analyzing capital punishment for decades, and today I want to share some of what they found. I'm Marissa. And I'm Avril. And we are your historians for this episode of Dig. Listeners, we're part of an exciting new community, the Himalaya app. This is a space where you can listen to all of your favorite podcasts and for shows like ours, become a member in our community. For less than $3 a month, you'll get access to the back catalog of our episodes ad-free. We'll also be sharing some exclusive content with our members in the near future. So download the Himalaya app and make it your go-to for all things podcasts. We also want to make sure to thank all of our Patreon supporters, but especially our Augur and Excavator level patrons. So Eric, Maddie, Colin, Susan, Christopher, Peggy, Danielle, Anne, Maggie, and Iris. Though your numbers grow every month, each and every one of you is a miracle to us. Thank you for thinking us worthy of your generous support. We love you. Love you. The murder of Hans Michael Furch by Agnes Katerina Schicken 
which I, I related at the be- at the top of the show, right, was researched and translated by historian Kathy Stewart. In many ways, this is a surprising story. Non-historians tend to believe that our world is more violent now than it's ever been. As the story goes, it was the 1970s that brought the birth of the serial killer, and the 1990s, the video games and movies that desensitized us to appalling violence. But we historians know different, especially early modernists like me. Early modern Europe was an incredibly violent place, and not just during wartime. Rapists, child killers, violent sociopaths, they've been around forever. Even more surprising, early modern states were not nearly as medieval as folks might think, a point illustrated well by Agnes's story. The state took into consideration Agnes's state of mind and empathized with her fragile mental state. In an age of witch hunts, even, they resisted the temptation to indict her for witchcraft. Still, this is not how this would have gone down 200 years earlier, and whipping and incarceration in the poorhouse was no walk in the park. Moreover, they did not give her what she wanted, which was death or indirect suicide. More on that phenomenon later, but suffice it to say that the existence of judicial torture, corporal discipline, and capital punishment made early modern Europe a very different place than it is today. We wanted to offer a quick note on definitions, just so, like, you know, we're on the same page. So, capital punishment is when a person is put to death by the state. So, essentially, it's another word for the death penalty. Corporal punishment, on the other hand, refers to physical punishment perpetrated on a person by the state. We also have to establish that the complexity of legal jurisdiction in early modern Europe is impossible to overstate. It was a veritable web of overlapping courts and overlapping bodies of law. The only general principle we can say for sure is that all European states had ecclesiastical courts, seigneurial courts, and state courts. In the early modern period, state courts increasingly encroached on the jurisdiction of the other two. Seigneurial and manorial courts were artifacts of feudal organization. Their jurisdictions, or seigneuries, were determined by the land holdings and privileges of the nobility who presided over them. The complaints handled by seigneurial courts typically looked like landlord-tenant disputes. Church courts were internal systems, subject to canon law, which were designed to minister to clergy and parishioners. Urban courts were also very common. These usually evolved out of city councils in highly populated areas. There were many other miscellaneous courts, such as those attached to town leadership, guilds, or military officer corps. State courts took on many different forms, catered to many different constituents, and enforced several different types of law, like common law, criminal law, civil law, statutory law, parliamentary statutes, and, you know, like the list goes on and on. European states typically had sovereign or superior courts that evolved out of dispute resolution structures within the monarch's court. Most areas of Europe also operated local royal courts whose jurisdictions could range in scope anywhere from village to city to county to bailiwick. Which is a hundred parishes. Uh huh. Yeah. I just like the word bailiwick. <laughs> it's very simple. It's just the best. Um, I think superior courts or sovereign courts that that someone might be most familiar with might be the Star Chamber, the Court of Star Chamber. Okay, so making things even more complicated, there were several different systems of law. Some of them practiced in particular courts, others applicable only to certain people, and others relevant only to certain districts or particular kinds of crime. Medieval European law was a mixture of Germanic and Celtic customary law, as well as Byzantine and Roman Latin codified law. Throughout the Middle Ages, different areas of Europe developed both customary and codified bodies of law, meaning they're written down so, you know, you can consult them, right? Throughout most of continental Europe, codified law reigned supreme. In England, William the Conqueror's 1066 invasion brought the Norman legal tradition to England. This combined with native legal traditions to make English common law. This is a customary body of law revolving around case law and precedent. And we've talked about this many times, most in um, the coverture episode, because that's a distinct feature of English common law. Ecclesiastical courts followed canon law, which was established by the various tribunals and synods of the Roman Catholic Church or the Eastern Orthodox Church, depending on where in Europe you're talking about. In the British Isles, the church court situation was more complicated. When England separated from the Catholic Church, the newly minted Church of England operated its own ecclesiastical courts under the authority of the crown. 
In the 19th century, the Church of England ecclesiastical courts were absorbed by English probate courts. Once again, this was all incredibly complicated, and we won't elaborate any more on this, but just keep in mind that we're trying to summarize trends in a very convoluted legal landscape. So most of the time, capital punishment was meted out in sovereign or superior courts, as well as in urban courts. It might be surprising to you, as it was to me when I first learned this, that the medieval period was not capital punishment's heyday. In fact, it's quite the opposite. Capital punishment was a distinct feature of Roman law codes, while European law was a mixture of customary traditions and ecclesiastical canon. It was not until the 13th century that European states began to revamp their legal codes in the image of Roman law. Roman law is partly responsible for the gruesome forms of corporal punishment that characterized early modern European penal systems. However, after Roman-style law was adopted in Europe, it took a couple hundred years for levels of capital punishment to rise meaningfully. So some historians, such as Daniel Lord Smale, have argued that 13th and 14th century courts were more likely to punish criminals through predation rather than capital punishment, even when they had committed violent crimes. So predation is essentially the seizure and liquidation of the accused person's assets. Um, their entire estate, really. Um, this was common in the High Middle Ages because during those years, absenteeism was a serious problem. So few European municipalities had jails, so indicted criminals were just notified of their court dates and expected to show up for their trial and sentencing. Unsurprisingly, most people charged with serious crimes absconded. So in response, the state seized their estates, especially in Mediterranean Europe. This is more than just a money grab. It was the ultimate humiliation and resulted in the social death of the accused. Germanic regions had always punished violent crime by financial means. The Vergald is the ultimate example. The Vergald was a price put on the life of a murdered person based on their social status. When a person was murdered, their murderer or the murderer's family was required to pay this price to the slain's family or their lord. This process was meant to settle the murderer's debt to society and to prevent blood feuds. One pre-Roman category of penal violence worth mentioning here is trial by ordeal. I just wanted to point out how incredibly rare and ancient this practice was because it's often conflated with the penal actions of witch hunts in the 16th and 17th centuries. Trial by ordeal required the accused to partake in some kind of dangerous activity, such as combat, exposure to fire, boiling water, or taking poison in order to prove their innocence. In the very early Middle Ages, this practice was found among Germanic and Celtic populations in Europe. The Roman Catholic Church banned trials by ordeal progressively during the Middle Ages. The increased centrality of Roman law to European penal systems marked the death knell of trial by ordeal. Even in jurisdictions subject to Roman-style legal codes early on, conviction rates for capital crimes were incredibly low throughout the 1200s and 1300s. So these horrific punishments that we're about to get to um, were on the books, but few people were actually enduring them. After 1400, the penal systems of Europe changed dramatically. It became more common for European municipalities to have holding facilities, as well as constables, votes, bailiffs, and sheriffs to execute arrest warrants. Indicted or even suspected criminals were typically held in custody. With this, criminals' ability to abscond became very limited. Still, this was not a modern penal system. Despite high levels of violent crime, most European villages and towns had no penitentiaries and no police force whatsoever. This is important for a couple reasons. One, it means that early modern communities shared informally the duties of policing. And two, it means that punishments needed to be severe in order to deter others from committing similar crimes and to prevent the likelihood of recidivism, which is a return to criminal activity after punishment. So basically, because there is no one policing these towns, the punishment of, you know, of criminals who have been caught has to do all that work, the work of deterrence. It has to do the work of finding um, the criminal's accomplices, right? And so that is why we'll see that the system involves so much violence. We can get a little peek into how corporal punishment was used as a mode of policing when we look into the history of judicial torture. By judicial torture, we mean the application of physical, mental, and emotional pain by an agent of the state. 
sometimes, namely in the context of the Inquisition or other operations aimed at rooting out heresy, judicial torture was applied for the purposes of compelling confession. This is often called the inquisitorial style of penal torture, and it is rooted in Roman law. This is the kind of judicial torture that was taking place during most early modern heresy and witchcraft trials. Despite the visibility of inquisitorial torture at this time, this was not what most judicial torture looked like. In most jurisdictions, in most times and places, judicial torture was highly regulated, ordered by a judge, and applied strategically to force the implication of accomplices. In a society without a police force, judicial torture was an important tool used to investigate standalone crimes and criminal enterprises. The Carolina Code of 1532 laid out a pattern of torture that was carefully cultivated to increase the probability of accurate information extraction. The code established a prescribed and systematic approach to torture to be carried out by executioners, hangmen, and skinners. The first step was merely showing the instruments of torture to the accused. You know, eh, you just, you know, do that. Um... <laughs> If the accused failed to confess, thumb screws were applied but not operated. So then they're like, eh, I can do this, you know. Um, thumb screws are essentially a vice with studs on them that were tightened to crush thumbs and toes. So if the accused refused to confess, um, even after the thumb screw had kind of been applied to their hand, um, only then were the thumb screws tightened. The process escalated from there to leg splints, whipping, and eventually the strapado. And this is hanging someone by their arms from behind and then strapping a weight on their feet to pull their shoulders and elbows out of their sockets. So at each phase, the torturer was, by law, required to allow the accused time to implicate their accomplices before escalation. So this method was not so much about punishing the accused as it was about investigating past crimes and criminal enterprises in order to prevent future crime. So they're trying to find, like, their partners in crime in order to... Um, help to police the streets, right? So in a society without formal policing, corporal punishment in the form of torture, shaming, banishment, or execution was the state's most powerful tool. Not all states followed the Carolina Code, however. Some jurisdictions applied torture more strenuous and for longer periods of time than human bodies could handle. One punishment common in England was pressing, the accused would be splayed on the ground in the shape of a cross with a board placed on top of them. Weights would be added to the board to slowly crush the accused to death. Ugh. This method was sometimes used to stimulate confessions, but inadvertently resulted in death. One Nottingham man was pressed to death by accident because his torturers were unaware that he was a mute. Meaning he couldn't, he couldn't speak, speak for right. one reason or another. In the 14th century, an English woman named Cecilia Ridgway was reportedly pressed and starved for 40 days in hopes that she would confess to the murder of her husband. The king was so impressed with her endurance, assuming it proved her innocence, that he pardoned her. By the 1600s, pressing was still used on occasion, but typically for people accused of high crimes, like the 44 people pressed to death under James I of England, or of egregious crimes such as family annihilation, which was the case with Walter Calverley of York, who was pressed to death after he killed his wife and sons. So it's in this sweet spot. When absconding became difficult, penitentiaries were rare, and policing was needed but hard to come by. This is when we see a drastic uptick in instances of capital punishment. This uptick lasted for several decades. In the town of Chester, England, for example, nine offenders were executed per year in the 1580s and 1620s. And this is a relatively small town, right? So it's kind of a lot. Um, the annual average reached 17. Um, it was during this spike that authorities meted out their most gruesome punishments, burning alive, drowning, live burial, beheading with the axe, um, breaking on the wheel, drawing and quartering, which is essentially live disarticulation and evisceration. Yeah. So, and then, you know, just a heads up, this is not the only spike. We see another spike <laughs> later, but they are very different kinds of spikes. The punishments that were preferred or abhorred varied from over time and space. 
So as it turns out, even the fear of torture and execution were culturally constructed. For example, in England, high-born convicts preferred beheading to hanging. They were customarily beheaded using an axe and a block. A good example might be Mary, Queen of Scots, who was beheaded in February 1586. In France and Germany, however, where elites also preferred beheading as an exceptionally honorable way to die, the act was done with a sword. In Muscovy, which is early modern Russia, on the other hand, hanging was most common but was applied mostly to men. Russian women, on the other hand, were typically beheaded or buried alive. Ooh. In many jurisdictions, we see gendered preferences, the most common one being that hanging was inappropriate for women. In France, officials took to strapping women's skirts around their legs so as to preserve their modesty as they swung from the gallows. Um, on the other hand, it was considered to be unproblematic when women were whipped or pilloried in the nude. Right. So it's kind of, I don't know. So some people have argued that the whole thing about tying, you know, preserving their modesty or whatever, like, why does that even matter? Because you would scourge someone or whip them being topless. Like what, you know? Vaginas versus boobies. Just, you think that's the difference? I think the, I think the hangups about boobs are a modern construction in that. Yeah. You wouldn't, because you wouldn't have been modest when you're breastfeeding your baby in the 15th century. You would have just no, you're f- done it. You're right. I mean, I study boobs. I should catch on to that. But even, I mean, even sometimes they were completely nude, like when they're pilloried, entirely nude. Yeah, that's weird. So, but I think that's part of it is the, like, it's supposed to be humiliating. Mm-hmm. But when you're being hanged, that, like, the humiliation is like, that's not part of that particular act yeah. so they're like oh let's protect her like it's just so strange but we'll we'll see why that is there's a lot of reasons why so um in most cases preferred methods of executions in the 1600s were chosen based on their compatibility with christian burial so not only was burning at the stake a painful death it also destroyed the remains so completely that christian burial was impossible so the same can be said and, and I, even now there's a lot of catholics who are like terrified of cremation um You've not see well you, your family, but that's common for Catholics to be like to clutch their pearls at the thought of cremation. And part of it is that it has been kind of drilled into them that as Catholics they need to you know have a coffin and be buried in consecrated ground and their body not destroyed um, for the second coming of Jesus. Yeah. So um, the same can be said for drawing and quartering, which resulted in the denigration and destruction of the body in front of a large crowd. Most convicts were granted the mercy of a Christian burial after their execution, except for extreme cases. Suicides were the only, quote, criminals, right? I'm saying that that's what they call them, not me, um, for whom Christian burial was customarily denied. Right, because suicide is illegal in this period. After 1630, execution rates fell dramatically all over Europe and remained low for the rest of the 1600s. By the 1680s, the rates of execution in Chester were 15% of what they'd been in the 1580s. Europe, however, did not become less violent. In fact, even though capital punishment was quantitatively more rare, we see a spike in indictments for certain kinds of crime during this lull. We see a peak in indictments for high crimes like treason, heresy, witchcraft, infanticide, sodomy, and petty treason. Petty treason is an aggravated form of murder that inverts social hierarchy, so apprentices who kill their masters, wives who kill their husbands, or sons who kill their fathers. Therefore, even though 1630 to 1680 marked a lull in the volume of executions, this time also marks some of the most incredible, highly publicized forms of mass hysteria that ended in capital punishment. So this includes, but is not limited to, witch hunts, especially common in Germany and Switzerland, uh, regicides like that of the Charles I, who was executed for high crimes and misdemeanors in um, 1649, Uh, Infanticide panics like the one in England that resulted in a 350% increase in neonaticide indictments by 1650, or the sodomy and bestiality panics that gripped Britain and colonial New England in the 1640s and 1650s. For example, the Earl of Castlehaven, the subject of an excellent legal historian named Cynthia Harrop, was executed for rape and sodomy in 1631. Harrop has found that the Earl of Castlehaven's sexual proclivities were much less shocking to the jury than his inability to order and administer his household. 
In New England, on the other hand, Puritan colonists responded to a perceived decline in moral rectitude by prosecuting swells of men and a host of animals for sodomy and bestiality. In some ways, it's hard to believe that this time qualifies as a lull at all. It appears that even though capital punishment was less common during this time, it was just as culturally important as it ever had been. Yeah, when I first started researching this and saw that there was a significant lull during that time, I was like, wait, what? That's when all of the crazy stuff happened. So, I mean, I I feel like there has to be maybe a reason why. Is the reason that capital punishment was actually deterring? And they no, <laughs> it's not that, oh, okay. um, which we'll talk about later. Um, so have no fear, though, everybody. Um, capital punishment enjoyed another resurgence. Execution rates rose drastically again after 1700. So in Amsterdam, for example, nearly twice the number of criminals, that's 281 people, were executed between 1700 and 1750 than had been executed in the 50 years prior, so 1650 to 1700, which was 151 people. So um, they're doubling um, the number of executions just in Amsterdam alone. Wouldn't that be because the population also grew, so it'd be more people, more criminals? Um, no. I mean, in this particular case, this in this example, you could probably argue that, but they've also just done it as percentages of the population. Like... Mm. Um, as rates rather rather than numbers. Okay. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Um, and then rates take into account the population mm-hmm. um, growth. Um, but they were just easier numbers to say for me, so I just included those. Um, so these executions were qualitatively different from those of the previous climax. The more theatrical forms of execution became less common, giving way to droves of hangings and beheadings by sword. Um, Remember, that's a punishment reserved for elites in earlier centuries. It becomes a little bit less fancy um, at this point. So um, in the rare case when less humane executions were carried out, mercy was generally shown to criminals at the moment of death. So in the later 1600s, it becomes common practice for the accused to be killed discreetly before rather than during the most gruesome of deaths. So an example, um, in Germany, criminals were often executed on the wheel. Um, This was essentially a platform that secured the accused as an executioner crushed their bodies with blunt weapons. So one could either be crushed from below, which took longer and hurt more, or from above, which resulted in a quicker death, probably from brain damage, right? Um... What does from below even mean? Like starting at your feet and going up. So your whole body gets oh, okay. super mangled before you die. Got it. I thought they were like... Oh, like... Underneath? No. <laughs> no. In the no, underneath. like from the feet up as opposed to the head up. <laughs> During the first spike in executions, criminals were more likely to be crushed from the bottom up. During the peak in the 1700s, criminals were almost always crushed from the top down, resulting in a speedier death. Sometimes the accused was even discreetly killed before their body was strapped to the wheel. Another particularly gruesome and painful punishment, burning alive, was made slightly more merciful after 1700 as executioners were likely to strangle or cut the throats of the accused before the flames reached their toes. So if you're thinking that this is evidence that the 1700s had grown more humane, You'd be wrong. In some ways, the increase in capital punishment is more alarming in the 1700s than it was earlier. This is because violent crime, which is still more common than today, was nonetheless on the decline since 1400. This means that even though there were fewer homicides and other violent felonies being committed, more people were facing execution anyway. And no, this is not just because of population growth. So, During this particular climax in capital punishments, many states changed which crimes were punishable by death. So more crimes, especially nonviolent crimes, were categorized as capital offenses. So this trend was experienced by most of Europe, but most notably in England. Um, The Waltham Black Act of 1723 made a whole host of nonviolent crimes punishable by death, including forgery, burglary, shoplifting, theft, and unauthorized return from penal transportation, among several other things. So people who were transported as part of their punishment, they snuck back in the country. Um, That was punishable by death. 
In large European cities, imprisonment or transportation to the colonies was becoming a more common option. But even so, several forms of imprisonment might also qualify as corporal punishment. Convicts could be sentenced to hard labor, penal servitude, or a whole host of abusive institutions of retention. The inventive corporal punishment of yore were jettisoned in favor of whipping, branding, and the pillory. In fact, whipping became so common after 1700 that it became mundane to most folks in European cities. There's hardly a day that went by that was not punctuated with the sharp sounds of a penal whipping, or flogging as it was known. Flogging was both painful and humiliating. One particularly cruel judge, George Jeffries, or the Hanging Judge, instructed his hangman to flog a woman thusly. Quote, Scourge her soundly, man. Scourge her till her blood runs down. It is Christmas, a cold time for Madame to strip. See that you warm her shoulders thoroughly. End quote. Most towns had a customary path that was traveled by the accused as the executioner, skinner, or hangman whipped them according to their sentences. This procession itself has an interesting history. The location of penal violence took on a new meaning during the 1600s. During the 1400s and 1500s, most towns hosted public executions within the town walls, often near the market or some other populated plaza. The execution structures, usually gallows, were rarely permanent. In some jurisdictions, they were built new for each execution. In Muscovy, executions were often staged at the scene of the crime. But by 1600, in the midst of high volumes of executions, most towns had built permanent execution structures outside the town walls. In Middlesex, England, Tyburn was established. Ravenstones, the customary execution structures in German-speaking lands, had mostly been relocated to the city limits. The new permanence of execution structures on the outskirts of town did a few important things. So first, it reinforced the stigmatization of the execution place. This stigma was nothing new, um, but the marginalization of the gallows endowed the execution grounds with a permanent stain of dishonor. Criminals accused of aggravated forms of crime or people who committed suicide were often buried under the gallows as an additional post-mortem punishment. Secondly, this new permanence allowed for the elaboration and ritualization of the customary procession from jail to the gallows. Some towns had established routes um, from which they never varied. Others sought to incorporate the scene of the crime into the procession ritual. If the accused was sentenced to corporal punishment before their execution, such as nipping with hot tongs, amputation, whipping, or branding, this was sometimes done in front of the house of their victim or at the scene of the crime. Now, back to that second climax in capital punishment after 1700. Hanging became the primary form of capital punishment in the 1700s, especially in England. The rudimentary gallows of the previous century were replaced with gallows that featured the drop, which allowed the accused to be hanged by way of a dropping trap door rather than requiring them to jump off a stool or a ladder. The appalling death penalties of the 1500s were still in use, but only under specific circumstances. Uh, Criminals convicted of high crimes, so crimes perpetrated by or against someone who is in a unique position of authority, or aggravated forms of felony were subject to these more brutal forms of execution, so burning at the stake for women and drawing and quartering for men. Disturbingly, though, this second spike in capital punishment was accompanied by increases in post-mortem harm, which might take the form of a public dissection or even the display of decapitated heads on a spike. After 1700, executed criminals all across Europe were infinitely more likely to be denied a dignified burial. Paul Friedland calls this post-mortem punishment, quote, permanent exile. This could be done by way of gibbeting or hanging in chains, which was the display of the rotting corpse in a public place for years. The remains of executed criminals were increasingly desecrated or discarded to add an extra level of horror to their sentence. Gibbets were human-sized cages meant to house rotting corpses after execution. All over Europe, gibbets were hung in whichever areas allowed them to be visible to most people. In the Netherlands, they swung along the waterways, visible to both land and ship traffic. Gibbets were enduring symbols of the inescapability of punishment, and they were found all over London in the 1770s. 
Robert Hazlitt was executed in 1770 for highway robbery. He had robbed the Newcastle Mail Service on Gateshead Common. So the Postmaster General, kind of like as part of revenge, um, requested that his gibbet be displayed there, you know, so he could like see it every day. Six years later, an American named Jabez Maud Fisher encountered Hazlitt's semi-mummified remains still swinging in the Gateshead Common. Um, he said, quote, his flesh seemed perfect and he could not have been long executed. One would suppose from the number of these distressing objects which throw themselves in our way in almost every common in England that it would have some effect in ridding the kingdom of those frequent robberies which are committed in every part of the country. However, this and every other terrible example have failed. Yeah. So it's funny because he says, oh, this mustn't have been here long, but it was six years past. Um, I think that's just because there was still like... There was, like, mummified tissue on it somehow. And some of these were there for, like, decades. Mm -hmm. So they were skeletonized entirely. So when he says it wasn't there long, he doesn't necessarily mean that it was, like, really recent. Um, He just means, oh, that's, like, a fresher one (laughs) kind of thing, which is disgusting. Um, But we have no other record of any other person being um, gibbeted there. So that's how we're pretty sure that it's um, Hazlitt. As the need for anatomical specimens increased across Europe, it became more common for the remains of the accused to be subject to public dissection and display in medical schools and anatomy museums. But this dire need for specimens was sometimes sacrificed for other priorities. The Murder Act of 1752, an act passed by the British Parliament, established gibbeting as an alternative to public dissection. Officials hoped that gruesome displays of post-mortem harm might curb what they perceived to be a crisis in forgery, smuggling, and other nonviolent crimes. It may be tempting to conclude that the merciful killings of the 18th century were preferable to the torturous punishments endured by 16th and 17th century criminals. It may also be tempting to conclude that it would be preferable to be a criminal during low rates of execution rather than a criminal during high rates, but in both cases, we would be mistaken. To our contemporary sensibilities, it's easy to, to draw a distinction between judicial execution, which resulted in death, and the range of state-sanctioned corporal punishment, which stopped short of death. After all, one form allowed a convict to escape with their lives intact, and the other did not. But that's not how early modern Europeans thought about the process. Capital punishment and the corporal punishments that stopped short of death were highly ritualized processes. And death was not the worst case scenario. According to historian Paul Friedland, the ritual of capital punishment in early modern Europe contained three phases, irrespective of its outcome for the convict. So first, public display and shaming. Second, expulsion and liminality. And then three, death, which could mean either social death or biological death. The first stage, uh, public display and shaming, was meant to humiliate the accused and give some sense of satisfaction to the victims of the crime. This stage could take many forms, but it typically involved a public reading of the convict's crimes and some type of public punishment or orchestrated display. Most often, criminals were publicly whipped, branded, or beaten as the community watched. In Scotland, quote-unquote, poorly behaved women convicted of disturbing the peace or public nuisance were often silenced with a scold's bridle or brank. This was a leather muzzle strapped around the accused heads to shame and humiliate her during her trial and punishment. It was common for this step to be repeated several times. In one 1735 punishment meted out in Paris, Pierre Bernard was strapped to a cart which was used to pick up the city's muck while his sentence was read aloud. He was beaten and whipped by the executioner in sight of the townspeople. He was then transported to several different places in the city. At each stop, his sentence was read aloud, and the executioner beat and whipped him. After four rounds of this, Bernard was transported to the doors of a temple where the last round of sentencing and beating took place. He was branded with the letters G-A-L and attached to a chain of galley slaves headed for Mediterranean ports. Bernard's punishment moved through Paris like a traveling carnival, spreading the news of his shame. This stage of the ritual often looked like this. 
Adulterers were forced to march naked through the streets. Some criminals were sentenced to ride an ass backwards all over town. Um, Sometimes this scene played out in reverse. The convict was trapped in one place for a prescribed number of hours, wearing a humiliating paper bonnet or an embarrassing sign. Some of the placards recorded for posterity include, quote, aggravated disturber of the public peace, end quote. Uh, Another one, would-be psychic and sorcerer. Um, And my favorite, quote, debauched libertine who plays with little girls, end quote. Yeah, he probably deserved it, right? Is that one your favorite? It's just interesting. It's not my favorite. Like, I don't want debauched libertines to play with little girls. I just think it's inter- It's the most interesting one. Well, my thought went to which of these are going to make a t-shirt, and it ain't going to be that one. <laughs> it's not. Definitely not that one. But would-be psychic and sorcerer. Yes. That's going on a t-shirt. Or aggravated disturber of public peace, because well, like that's that quite accurate. So... Um, by 1500, many towns had specifically built pillory towers for the sole purpose of displaying and shaming criminals for their crimes. Convict sentences were read aloud as they were chained to the pillory. In some cases, the sentence was performed repetitively for days. The shaming stage had much older roots in the late medieval ceremony of penitence that required the accused to suffer public whipping or to perform self-flagellation in a public ceremony. This was a particularly compelling ritual for Catholics who tended to understand pain as a purifying force. Devout Catholics sometimes used this purifying force on themselves, uh, performing mortification like self-flagellation of their own flesh. The most common form of self-mortification was the hair shirt, a garment made of rough, abrasive fabric meant to induce constant discomfort. Historians sometimes point to the purifying nature of pain to explain the spate of executions perpetrated on Protestants by the Catholic Mary I of England. This understanding of pain did, however, influence Protestant thought as well, which partially explains why Protestants elevated executed Protestants to the level of martyrs immediately after their deaths. These ordinary Protestants had achieved a level of holy purity by way of suffering the pain of of execution. In Catholic areas of Europe, the ritual of public penance evolved into elaborate secular ceremonies. In France, criminals were often sentenced to perform the amende honorable. This ritual punishment required the accused to walk barefoot, nude, or partially nude, with a rope around their neck carrying a wax candle and a weight in their hands. In this condition, they were brought to either a very public place, such as the entryway to a popular church, the market, or even a scene of the crime. They were then forced to fall on their knees in front of the crowd in order to confess the details of their crimes and publicly beg forgiveness from God, the king, and the crime's victims. Historians suspect that the Amen Honorable may have evolved from the Salic practice of Canacruda. In cases where a murderer was unable to pay the vergeld, they were required to debase themselves and to uproot themselves from the community, either literally or symbolically. Irrespective of the accused's ultimate fate, they were always compelled to undergo this initial display and shaming before they moved on to the next stage of the ritual. Stage two was expulsion and the imposition of liminal status, and it could be imposed on the accuser either before and or after death. Liminality is an anthropological term that, in historian Esther Cohen's words, was, quote, a means of demarcating the boundaries between the normative community and those who had offended against it. This stage typically involved banishment or exile of some kind, either temporary or permanent. Stage two of Pierre Bernard's punishment, for example, was banishment to the galleys, a permanent expulsion and enslavement. Temporary banishment sometimes ended with the practice of corporal compensation. In other words, a banished criminal might sometimes earn acceptance back into the community by paying a price. That price was typically mutilation of some sort. Most often, mutilation or branding served the purpose of marking criminals who were permanently banished, at least before 1600. Permanent banishment offered none of the solace that death offered to faithful Christians. You were forever condemned to live apart from your community, stigmatized in this life and the next. This was a fate worse than biological death for most early modern people. After 1600, the state began to use targeted mutilations for specific crimes such as sodomy, blasphemy, and theft. Sodomites had their genitals removed, 
blasphemers their tongue or lips, and thieves their hand or foot. Thieves were, for most of the early modern period in France, branded with a fleur-de-lis. After 1724, however, the fleur-de-lis was replaced with a V. Men who committed a second offense were branded with G-A-L and sent to a lifetime in the galleys. So you might have a V and then a G-A-L and sent off. Or you could just have a V if it was your first offense. Women, because they were not eligible for the galleys, were branded with another V, so a double V, and banished to the workhouse. These mutilations permanently marked egregious offenders with the stigma of their crimes. Mutilations were also meant to prevent criminals from reoffending. One can hardly commit sodomy without genitals or blasphemy without a tongue to speak. Mutilations became less frequent in Europe after 1600, but when they were performed, it was typically to mark the crime as a particularly egregious crime and not the offender as having liminal status. For example, crimes that subverted natural hierarchies, like parricide, a child killing a father, mariticide, a a wife killing her husband, or regicide, an attempted regicide, all carried an aggravated punishment. In France, these convicts had their hands severed off before their death sentence. In England, women convicts found guilty of these crimes were sentenced to the least humane form of execution, burning alive. In England, after the Waltham Black Act, which I already mentioned before, but just to remind you, it was passed in 1724, um, mutilations were commonly used for property crimes. For example, Sir Peter Stringer was found guilty of forging deeds in 1731. He was sentenced to a time in the Charing Cross pillory. So when he was immobilized, quote, the hangman, John Cooper, came up behind him and with a knife like a gardener's pruning knife, cut off his ears and held them up so the mob could see them. Having handed them to Mr. Watson, the sheriff's officer, the hangman slit both nostrils with a pair of scissors, end quote. So these sites earned England's 18th century penal system the nickname Bloody Codes. And this all brings us to stage three of the penal ritual, uh, and that is death. For some, this death was a social death that did not include execution, but did mar their life on earth and extended their death sentence into the next life. For many, death meant immediate execution and merciful post-mortem reintegration into the society that had expelled them. For the especially unlucky, stage three consisted of both immediate execution and permanent exile. Not all convicted criminals made it this far in the ritual. First-time offenders especially were sometimes thrust into the ritual at the beginning and pulled out somewhere along the way to their final destination. And this was actually more common than you might think. In fact, the possibility of a last-minute pardon or commutation of sentencing could be part of the torture. In Muscovy, women convicted of aggravated crimes such as witchcraft or infanticide were buried alive. They were interred standing upright, only their heads exposed. Guards were deployed to guard the accused for days, sometimes weeks, preventing anyone from helping her as she died from dehydration, starvation, or exposure. These women were occasionally pardoned during their ordeal and allowed to join a convent. This was not typical, but it was common enough to make the burial all that more torturous. Can you imagine just sitting there and not knowing if, like, you're just going to... Be pardoned? Yeah. Or -hmm. if you're just going to starve to death being there. Mm -hmm. Like, sometimes they'd even give them water so it would take longer so it would starve to death instead of dying from dehydration or whatever. Oh, my Mm -hmm. God. Just sounds crazy. And, like, in their lifetime, they probably would have witnessed at least one person being kind of, like, pardoned. So they're like, oh, maybe that could happen to me, right? Mm -hmm. Interestingly, death was typically considered temporary rather than permanent expulsion. In 1396, Francis Charles VI issued a decree mandating Catholic confession prior to judicial execution. For the next few hundred years, then, criminals executed in France were buried in consecrated ground and accepted back into the community of the faithful after death. Though statutes varied by jurisdiction, it was common in Christian Europe for criminals to enjoy the benefit of confession, consolation, and company with clergy. In Catholic Europe, laymen established confraternities designed to officiate at public executions. One of these brotherhoods in France and Belgium was called Penitent Noir, articulated their duties in their founding articles this way. So this translation is by historian Paul Friedland, and once again, it's um, the articles of constitution that were drawn up by the 
uh, penitent noir. So Article 6, um, in so much as one of the principal aims in establishing the pious company of charity is the assistance and consolation of the miserable patients condemned to the ultimate punishment. It is in these sad moments that the light of zeal and charity of the confraternal members must shine forth. As soon as the rector is warned of an execution, he'll assemble all the members of the confraternity in the church of St. Orléans, where the regalia will be brought for the convenience of said confraternal members, after which they'll leave the said church, marching two by two in a procession in order to make their way to the prison. And, once arriving there, they will march in a procession before the patient, accompanied by two ecclesiastical brothers who will exhort the patient to die well. These brothers will be covered in a black cloth. On the way, they will sing the prayers for the dying until the execution has been done, after which will be sung the psalm de profundis, during which the members of the confraternity will untie the body of the patient and will put it in a shroud in sight of everyone, and said body will be carried in a coffin by four of the brothers. And the body will be carried to the church of St. Cesadra or St. Orléans in order to be buried in a designated place the following day. The brothers singing along the way, the miserere, the de profundis, and other psalms destined for the souls of purgatory. It's just interesting that they, the whole confraternity was like, one of our main goals is to accompany these executed criminals and Mm -hmm. take care of their body afterwards. Yes. Like, we don't even have, like, we barely have people who will do that now. Yeah. You know, it's weird. It is. So, judicial executions often resembled miniature passion plays, ending in the criminals' as well as the community's salvations. Historian Michel Bay calls them spectacles of sacrifice. In Paris, it was customary for the executioner's procession to stop at the convent of Fille where the accused would receive a last meal of bread and wine, as well as a crucifix to kiss and wear around their necks. They had a vested interest in the criminal salvation. Michel Bay explains it in this way, quote, The criminal who has violated the prohibition of murder has, by his act, entered into the world of the sacred. He has endowed himself with an energy that renders his presence harmful and contagious. He introduces disorder into society and in the relations between society and the divine. The only reconciliation possible between the murderer and the society rests, therefore, in the sacrifice which frees him from his stain. In other words, the penal ritual was just as beneficial to the soul of the community as it was to the soul of the accused. The audience took this very seriously. They sometimes attacked heartless officials, incompetent executioners, or uncooperative convicts who broke the spell and ruined the cathartic release that they sought. The public was so invested in capital punishment that many historians have argued that rather than some ritualistic catharsis, public executions were the ultimate entertainment. Kind of like gladiators, right? Um, This model of interpreting capital punishment works well, um, particularly for the English context. The Middlesex site of Tyburn, just outside of London, drew thousands of spectators to its public hangings. The accused were made to sit in a cart that was pulled from Newgate Prison, where their sentence had been pronounced three miles to the outskirts of London to the gallows. Beloved criminals were celebrated, a phenomenon that inspired resentment among public officials and enraged the judiciary. Just as often, the public display their disgust with the accused or their approval of the death sentence by teasing the convict and throwing rotten food and excrement at them. Gross. Irrespective of the standing of the accused in the community, the public hung on every word as they delivered their last speech. Most speeches were subsequently augmented into morality tales that were published and circulated across the country. The gals at Tyburn were remarkable, consisting of a three-cornered set of crossbeams that could hang 24 people at one time. It was called the Triple Tree, and it was typically used every three weeks. Aristocrats and the respectable classes rented window seats near the events, while commoners flooded the muddy field in front of the gallows. Especially infamous executions turned into full-blown festivals. There might be anywhere from 5,000 to 40,000 spectators. The gin was flowing, the pasties were steaming, and the crowd was waiting for a show. 
The condemned occasionally performed for the crowd, telling jokes, dancing, and delivering monologues to the teeming masses. The communal interpretations of capital punishment as either a performance of salvation or some form of entertainment are reinforced by the fact that officials went forward with punishment even when there was no body on which to enact the judicial violence. Remember, in the medieval period when criminals absconded, which they did in the vast majority of cases, authorities seized their belongings, erasing their local identity and finalizing their banishment. Not so in the early modern world. When convicts absconded in the early modern world, authorities went ahead, executing the prescribed punishment on a proxy or effigy. The common conception of an effigy, at least to us Americans, is some three-dimensional scarecrow-looking approximation of a human. This is probably because revolutionary-era effigies in the American colonies appeared that way, but this was not the norm. Effigies were almost always two-dimensional paintings or drawings of the accused. In Paris, effigies typically took the form of a quick drawing of the accused um, actually being executed. In Geneva, the effigies were usually paintings of the accused, which were subjected to the procession from the prison to the gallows, with no variation from how the execution might have looked if the criminal had been present. The paintings were even whipped or mutilated if that had been part of the sentence. Doesn't that just seem ridiculous? I just, I don't, yeah. So um, when taken to its rational limits. Um, the whole ordeal must have been ridiculous to behold. So in 1539, one French barrister named Jean Frollo was convicted of murder and sentenced to have his hand cut off in front of the house of his victim and to be executed by hanging. Frollo was somehow absent for his execution, so authorities paid a considerable sum for local craftsmen to construct an elaborate mannequin who underwent the punishment in his stead. In Europe, three-dimensional effigies were replaced by paintings or drawings after 1600. Um, so yeah, so this particular, they like, they have records of, they paid like a lot of money, many livres, to, to put this like wooden mannequin together so they could cut its hand off. That's a good use of But the actual funds. person was gone. Like, it's just, yeah. And so, I, to us, to me, it always made so little sense. Like, sometimes in records, they won't even say whether an execution was in effigy or of the person. And it's like, that's kind of important. Mm -hmm. You know, like, to us, that's like, that's the most important part. Right. But to them, it was not. Right. As absurd as executing a painting may seem, executions in effigy were more common than you could have even imagine. Some excellent historians have been able to quantify the use of effigies in capital punishment. So Julius Ruff discovered that one-third of all capital cases were tried in the absence of the accused in southwestern France. Benoit Garneau found that this was the case for 40% of capital cases in Burgundy. Michel Poré found that 85% of capital sentences in Geneva between 1755 and 1790 were executed on an effigy. So 85%. <laughs> like all like of them. Like what are you that's, even doing? That's just all of them. That's just all of them. Yeah. Uh, there appears to be very little difference between capital execution proper and capital execution in effigy for early modern people. Sometimes officials didn't even bother to indicate whether it was a human body or an effigy that underwent the punishment. Once again, seems very important to know, right? Mm -hmm. Like just for posterity or for, you know, their family or for, like, the person themselves. It's just so crazy. I mean, they knew, but they didn't care. I mean, they, how would they... They would have absconded. They wouldn't really know that they went... That they executed them in effigy. I'm just saying it doesn't even punish them. Because they're not even there to know that it happened. So it's not like it shamed them because they just already left. Well, like, the they're... The Marquis Assad knew that he had been executed in effigy. Well, very fancy people would have known. Yeah, but some know. random villager who was executed for theft or whatever and absconded would not know. And the punishment itself was the banishment of yeah. having to stay away. But the actual, like, but that's not what mattered. What mattered was that the community needed it to happen because mm -hmm. he had nothing to do with it. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It, it's just so straight. Like, it does seem like there was some superstition about, like, there being bad juju that they had to, like, purge in order to move on. 
Effigies were sometimes used in early modern penal rituals when the accused had died by suicide before their sentence was carried out. So, in some jurisdictions, the corpse of the accused was used in the ritual as if they were still alive. Um, Paul Friedland found one case where a convict killed himself, but his corpse was so decomposed before he was found that authorities were unable to use it for the execution. It was too stinky. Um, They used an effigy instead. Given the ubiquity of executions and effigy, it appears that the fine line between life and death for the accused hardly even mattered. It was the ritual that was important, so that, in Friedland's words, quote, the fact of the crime itself could be overcome, end quote. You have to think, though, that the difference between biological life and death would have mattered to the accused, right? I mean, it had to have, or else they wouldn't have absconded, right? Um, So one would think so, but I think it's fair to say that the early modern world Social death in that world and eternal damnation were also, like, terrifying options, right? The preference for a good death over permanent exile or eternity in hell can be illustrated by the fact that most convicts cooperated with all of the phases of capital punishment. It was very rare for someone to refuse to do something. They just, they did it. They did what they were told. And it's not because they were browbeaten. Like, they they did it because they valued their salvation, Mm -hmm. Records typically indicate that in almost all cases, the accused willingly performed their penal ritual. They performed whatever acts of penance were requested of them, compliantly endured their procession, the various indignities and humiliations that marked their trip to the gallows. Most astonishingly, they often delivered last speeches that were published far and wide all over Europe. These speeches often included contemplative reflections on their troubled lives, morality stories meant to steal the next generation against their particular vices, or diatribes about the righteousness of their trial and justice of their sentence. This is best explained by the suggestion that capital criminals took their salvation seriously. Right, otherwise they had no reason to cooperate like that. Mm -hmm. The importance of eternal salvation is also illustrated by one of early modern Europe's most haunting phenomena. So this is coming back to the story we told at the top of the show. And that's suicide by proxy. Suicide by proxy is sometimes called indirect suicide. And it's one of the unfortunate byproducts of states who rely on capital punishment to deter crime. The killing of John Michael Furch by Agnes Catherine Schicken, like I told at the um, top of the show, is a great example of this. Suicide by proxy can be found in the historical record primarily after 1670, so during the second spike in capital punishment experienced by early modern Europe, the beginnings of that second spike. Mm -hmm. Because of the prevalence of capital punishment, devout and suicidal Christians essentially used murder as an instrument of salvation. They usually sought out young and innocent, but baptized children to murder. They reasoned that young children were sinless, guaranteed eternal salvation. After murdering an innocent child, they presented themselves to the authorities, eager for the death sentence, which would, ceremoniously, bring an opportunity for repentance before death, thereby guaranteeing them both self-imposed death or suicide and eternal salvation. Right. They're rigging the game. So, as I suggested at the top, um, historian Kathy Stewart wrote an excellent article and book chapter about this, um, where she offers the following explanation for this horrific phenomenon. In early modern Europe, people who took their own lives were denied a Christian burial, especially in Catholic regions. Not only was suicide a cardinal sin, it was thought to pollute consecrated ground. In cases of obvious mental illness, parishes sometimes authorized the burial of suicides on church grounds. Popular belief in the pollutive effect of suicide was so strong that parishioners sometimes disinterred the remains of suspected suicides and disposed of them elsewhere. In Germany, one common folk belief was that the bodies of suicides could not be removed from their dwellings via the doorway. Many believed that if a suicide was carried over the threshold of their home, their ghost would return to the house after being rejected by God. Therefore, it became a common practice for the bodies of suicides to be removed through a hole dug under the threshold rather than through the doorway. In most of Europe, the town's executioner or skinner was in charge of burning or otherwise disposing of the remains of any suicides in their district. Sometimes they buried the remains beneath the gallows, which was regarded as an infamous, dishonorable, and already polluted place. Protestant theology regarded suicide differently 
and Protestants did not consecrate burial grounds. Um, but most Protestant authorities reinforced the Catholic prohibition on Christian burial for suicides as a means of deterring others from carrying out their suicidal urges. Therefore, all of Europe witnessed spates of suicide by proxy, um, capital crimes perpetrated on innocents for the sole purpose of provoking the state into taking their lives. This allowed the faithful to achieve their desired outcome, their death, but it guaranteed them the benefits of Christian burial and, by extension, everlasting salvation. And interestingly, it's actually, um, suicide by proxy is actually more common in Protestant Europe than it was in Catholic Europe, um, which is strange because Protestants, purportedly, they're not really supposed to have that same kind of superstition about um, uh, suicide preventing salvation, um, but oftentimes they did anyway. So one Swedish man who had a good reputation stabbed a four-year-old boy in the neck while he played in his yard. During his confession, during his confession, the man said, I know very well that there is no surer way to achieve eternal salvation than if the fully conscious soul exits a strong body and is carried upward toward God by the pious prayers of people of faith. I realized it would be impossible to die this way unless I committed a capital crime, so I thought it would be easiest if I killed a boy not yet corrupted by this life, end quote. According to his vicar, the man went to his death, quote, joyfully, loudly singing sacred hymns. I mean, the logic is there. Yeah, but why is it more common in Protestant Europe than Catholic then? Because Catholics have even more of a prohibition against suicide than Protestants by a lot. Most scholars just think it's because Protestant leaders, like Martin Luther himself, was like, yeah, suicides can still go to heaven, but, like, don't tell them that because then they'll all just off themselves. So mm -hmm. he kept it, like, a secret. So some people think it's because Protestants were, like, constantly um, living this life of, like, perpetual dread wondering whether they are saved or not whereas catholics are just like well i went to confession so i'm saved the end you know and don't have to worry about it right, anymore i can go do my stuff and then come back and confess again yeah. right so go they think that kill that was... child and confess and then i'll be all right right well the cognitive load of of all of that guilt and self questioning and insecurity and all of that stuff they think is might be why suicide by proxy was so common in Protestant areas. Weird. So suicides by proxy followed a distinct pattern. The victims were young children or intellectually disabled adults who were childlike. The murders were carefully calculated and premeditated, with the accused taking days or even weeks to plan. The murderer usually heaped affection onto the child or plied them with gifts and treats prior to murdering them. The slayings were brutally violent. We're talking like decapitations, drownings, and severe blunt force trauma. The murderer typically presented themselves to authorities immediately after the offense, confessed fully, and gleefully awaited their execution. During the investigations, most perpetrators elaborated on the child's moment of death, claiming that they solemnly agreed to die or that they dutifully recited their prayers as they complied with their murderer's plan. Stewart thinks that these are probably augmented as part of the perpetrator's psychological need to assure themselves of the child's salvation, thereby guaranteeing a net gain in saved souls. After all, if the proxy suffered damnation, then the person who was suicidal merely switched their own damnation for the proxies. Mm -hmm. By 1750 or so, the relationship between citizens and the state appeared to have changed. Permanent gallows and the festivals that were launched around them at execution time, they all had an unanticipated effect. The ordered, revered ritual of execution, common for most of the early modern period, had always served to reinforce the state's authority. Michel Foucault describes this process as one in which the state establishes its monopoly over legitimate violence. Right? So nobody else can commit violence, but as a state, we can tell you to fight in a war, which is violence. We can tell you to murder people, and that is legitimate. Um, and we can murder you legitimately through capital punishment, but you can't um, commit violence. Your violence is illegitimate. Um, so perhaps it was the increase in post-mortem punishment, um, the increased visibility of botched executions, or the recategorization of property crimes as eligible for the death penalty. Historians aren't exactly sure. But by 1750, public execution began to work against the state's aims. The solemn ceremonies of yore had evolved into carnivals reclaimed by the mob in opposition to the state. 
At the same time, the unauthorized use of human remains by anatomists was a hot-button issue, prompting several anatomy riots, a crackdown on grave robbing and body snatching, and a spate of anatomy acts which formalized the use of executed remains for anatomical study. In Britain, Germany, and Muscovy specifically, later 18th century reformers harnessed this public discontent to muster up support for penal reform. With the exception of revolutionary France, where the guillotine separated the bodies of record numbers of aristocrats from their heads, uh, capital punishment was on its last leg in the 1790s Europe. Liberalizing European states built penitentiaries and established professional police forces, obviating the need for the dramatic capital punishments of previous centuries. Britain, Scandinavia, continental Europe, and Muscovy incrementally abolished inhumane modes of execution and punishments designed to humiliate and shame perpetrators throughout the 1800s. Though public execution remained into the 20th century, imprisonment became the standard punishment, even for some violent crimes, and methods of execution became increasingly humane. German authorities dismantled the permanent gallows and ravenstones in the late 18th and early 19th century. Britain abolished most forms of corporal punishment, especially the gruesome mutilation that had characterized the bloody codes. In the face of growing secularism and declining executions, Instances of suicide by proxy plummeted and then disappeared. By 1900, capital punishment was still in use in most parts of the world, but was typically reserved for violent and aggravated crime. Um, Obviously, this is not at all where the story ends, right? At 1900, we still have the death penalty in some states in the U.S. And um, in Britain, it wasn't abolished, I don't think, until the 1950s. Uh, they were doing hangings until the late 1950s. Um, and so the end of the early modern period is certainly not the end of capital punishment at all. Um, but it's the end of this particular phase of capital punishment where the state is using it to in, in instead of policing, like mm-hmm. as a way of policing, because now it's kind of used, you know, much more sparingly and... There are endless, you know, um, court procedures that you have to go through. And in some states like California, it's kind of like de facto abolished and you can be sentenced to the death penalty, but you just stay in jail till you die because the actual executions are not going to happen. You know, it's very complicated, Mm -hmm. um, all having to do with new understandings about bodily autonomy and civil rights and things like that. Um, So this is really just the, the first half of a very long story. One that I probably, I kind of want to do later. (laughs) But yeah, that's for another episode. So um, you can email us at hello at digpodcast.org. Why are they going to email us? If you have... To tell us that we suck so hard? I don't know. No, if you want to send us some fan mail. Okay. Yeah, Yeah, if you want to send us some fan mail, um, please take a minute and... Rate and review us wherever you listen. Um, It's really, really important for us to be discovered. That's how iTunes and other platforms um, build their algorithm. So people won't even know that we exist unless you do that. So please, please, please do that. And if you'd like to support us on Patreon, you can go to patreon.com slash digHistory. You can follow us on Twitter and Facebook, uh, dig underscore history. And join our Facebook Dig History Pod Squad. Yeah, it's just a dorky little group. We're, there's not tons of people. We just like post um, some funny memes or ask certain questions or interact with the, our fans um, uh, however we can. And you so. can always join us in our Himalaya community um, by downloading the Himalaya app and becoming a member of our Dig Podcast um, community. Yeah, and that way you can get ad-free episodes. Mm -hmm. Um, Through Patreon you have to donate $5 a month, but through Himalaya, $2.99 a month, and the first month is free, and you still get the ad-free episodes. So if you use Himalaya, you can get the ad-free episodes for a lot cheaper. Yeah. I mean, not a lot cheaper, but you know, enough. Yeah. So thanks for listening, and we'll catch you next time. Thanks, love you, bye! Walter Calvary. Cal... (laughs) Yeah, that's a horrible last name. Calverly. Joyfully Loudly singing scare. See, <laughs> joyfully, I know. Contemplative reflections on their. Contemplative. It's not contemplative. It can be. No, it's, not. it's what I say it is. Whatever.
repeatedly for days. Can Meaning, you, can you say, they would... You said, like, repeatedly and repetitively in one word. Can you... No, I said performed repeatedly for days. Repetitively for days. Yeah, you said repetitively. You didn't say repetitively. I, did you I said, say... You said repetitively. Oh, okay. <laughs> it was, like, repeatedly <laughs> and repetitively in one. Mm -hmm. Agnes and a boy. <laughs> Agnes and a boy. Okay. Her thro His throat was sliced so deeply that she... What, what is... Why can't I... Yeah. Okay. Are you going to be gnawing this whole time? Okay, let's get the... Let's get it over with. Oh, done. <laughs> Swallow. Okay, okay, then just keep going. My hand smells so good. That that stuff is good. Very powerful. Nice. Yeah, I really like it. Okay. Okay. <laughs>